Paul, you were in charge of Unilever for 10 years. You've had to make you know, decisions on the longer term, on the short term. H how difficult just is it to be a chief executive? Like, how do you, when do you realize what you're worth? Is it in, in a crisis or in the long term kind of motivation of the troops? Well, it's probably both. And in fact, it's a very difficult job in the sense that you have to be promoted into that job without really having ever done it. And yet the skill sets that are needed for that job are quite different. So when I became CEO, I, I wasn't feeling as comfortable and, and, and as uh, confident as I would normally feel. And there are very few people you can reach out to and very few people that can help contextually uh, in a situation like that, especially when you come into a company you've not worked before and you don't fully understand how it functions. And yet everybody expects you to immediately come with the Oracle of Delphi and make the right decisions and the 100 day plan. I've always personally objected to that, but it's difficult. So did you, you feel what you felt a little bit of what imposter syndrome no, when you started? Or, uh, well, surely not. I, I definitely um, said to the board that uh, there are med better people than me to take that job. And I actually gave them names to interview. So this is back people. in 2009. Yeah, 2008. So 2008. I definitely I wasn't looking for a CEO job day because, you know, it's uh, all serendipity and uh, your predecessor needs to leave. The board needs to look. There might not, it's always better to have an internal candidate that wasn't there. So this is a lot of serendipity. And my name was in the papers because I didn't get the job at, at Nestle at that time. They gave it to a lifer, uh, uh, Paul Bulk at that time. So that's why headhunters so, are- So how long, how long did it take for you to feel like on top of the job at Unilever as the, uh, as the CEO? I, I don't think you'll ever be because you always have to be sharp. The moment you feel you're on top of the job or you become relaxed, I think it's time to move on. Um, and, and some CEOs, and my signal for that with other CEOs is when they start talking about all the wonderful things they've done, uh, then it's really, time time, to go. it's really time to go. So you have to be, uh, no, I think the most important skill sets that you have that you always need to have and also in terms of crisis is to have a high uh, moral compass. And it's not surprising that the first thing I did was reach out to Bill George, who uh, was the chairman of Medtronics, but now teaches at Harvard, had written a book which was called True Norse, Find Your Own Purpose, Find Your Own, you know, what makes you tick. Uh, I don't believe you can be a purpose-driven company or a sustainable company if you're not purposeful or sustainable yourself either. So I worked with him to um, work with the 500 top leaders at Unilever at that time. I had an other hidden agenda uh, I needed uh, to understand these 500 people because they were going to be the key people I, I needed to rely on in terms of building our new strategy. So it gave me a year actually to think about the strategy, but also to collectively work on what the purpose of this company should be because we clearly had lost it. And that was a very powerful thing. And um, but, but, but the leadership skills I think are evolving, but the basic leadership skills that you need to run these companies will always stay the same. But Paul, when you talk about purpose, I mean, does it have to be good purpose or can the purpose also just be making money, keeping shareholders happy oh. and making money? <coughs> Which is true for many that operate under that way. But let me remind you that the average tenure of a CEO has now dropped to four and a half years. Let me remind you that when I was born, the average length of a publicly traded company's existence was 67 years. Uh, now it's 17 years. I think we've shown that the Milton Friedman period, which was disguised by many other things, uh, is, is more destructive for society now than, than we thought. That the single-minded pursuit of shareholder primacy uh, doesn't really work. Uh, the graveyard of, uh, uh, of companies that pursue that strategy is, is absolutely full of, uh, of that. So increasingly, we can show that companies that work multi-stakeholder longer term, put purpose at the core, have a higher, at least a better opportunity to get a better return. And, and I think that's increasingly the model. The uh, financial market now, interestingly, there are more people now in the financial market trying to encourage companies to be more longer term than the companies themselves are. So it, it's, uh, this notion that it's the financial market that puts that pressure on you, I would actually even challenge right now. There are some elements of the financial market that put pressure on you, but um, you don't always have to uh, give in to those. You know? If you let your uh, Unilever at over 100,000 decent shareholders, if you want to call it that way, uh, if you would listen to all the shareholders and do what they were asking you to do, your company would be bankrupt before you knew it. I mean, you, you've spoken about the need for that sort of moral compass as a kind of imperative increasingly now to attract staff as well, because otherwise people increasingly will make decisions about who they want to work for, depending on that 
North Star, that moral compass. And that's a, that's a shift, isn't it? Now that's a generational shift. Oh, we've seen a big shift, uh, David. And it's actually a generational shift, but not as big as, as the shift itself, if I may say. In one of my foundations, we ran a study amongst 4,000 people in the US and Europe. And what we found was that two thirds of the people now select companies. Of course, they want good pay and, and be competitive and take care of their families. That goes by itself. But two thirds of the people that were looking for uh, jobs wanted to work for companies with a bigger purpose. People want more. They want to make a bigger difference in life than, they, than, than just getting salary. And uh, that's a key driver now. Uh, now, interestingly, 30% of the people we interviewed had deliberately left a company because they couldn't find that purpose. And 60% of the people we interviewed were actually considering leaving the company. Half of them didn't have confidence in the CEO. They said the talk and the walk were not the same. So in this survey, we call for higher ambitions of companies. We call for better communication and transparency. But we call also for giving higher agency to the people in the companies to be part of that transition. Uh, so we call it conscious quitting, and that's probably a new trend. You are right that you see it go up when you get from the baby boomers to the millennials to the Gen Zs and the Gen mm -hmm. Ys. Uh, you see the numbers going up. And generations now is 10 years, by the way. In it's not a generation the way we thought about it. Um, their loyalty to companies has also shortened for each of those generations. Why? It's now less than two years because they clearly can't find what they're looking for in these companies. And so Are they just being unrealistic? I mean, the idea that every not company at all. can have I mean, a... Unilever, we put purpose right in the middle and created the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. We saw our engagement scores go up from the bottom tercile when the company was not doing so well to the top of the top tercile of 8,000 companies. We became the third most looked to com company in LinkedIn after Google and Apple. And we are not a company name. Unilever is a, an abstract name. The products are much better known. So... Um, no, we, we, we really see that as a driver. In fact, I, I want to make a point there because it comes to mind. In, in uh, 2015, 16 or so, I uh, was in a meeting here in London somewhere and the financial people from the city were saying we cannot attract talent. So I thought it was strange because in Unilever we had an attraction to more talent than we could deal with. And it uh, was another problem. We didn't have any turnover in the company either because nobody wanted to leave the company. This is another problem. But the people in the financial market were saying, oh, we have such a hard time attracting t talent because all of a sudden there's pay restraints or, uh, you know, m my bonuses are being looked at. So I asked our people, I said, in my office, literally, I'm, I, I was at Blackfriars where Unilever's offices are. I literally look out over the city. I said, just give me the numbers of the bonuses that these people were getting that year in the city. And what did we find? That the bonuses of the city alone were bigger than the total salary bill of Unilever. And that's 175,000 right. employees trying to change the world. That's the power of purpose. If you say I can't attract people, you have to wonder why. It's not because of salary. You can't solve everything by throwing money at it. I think that's proven to be the case in, in many things. But how do you motivate people then? You do motivate people by making them part of something bigger than they can be themselves. Obviously, you want to invest in people. You want to recognize people. But above all, people want to belong. They want to be part of. So that's, that's higher. That's more important than pay. No, there are always minimum conditions. It's like, well, it's like your products now. you sell. Your products you sell need to perform. They need to taste good. Otherwise, why buy them? But then, once you've done this minimal hurdle, people will, put the, will make a choice for the companies that they respect, for the products that are more sustainable. So most of these discussions are always people don't want to pay for sustainable products. It's just the wrong discussion. So we need to be able to provide the minimum competitiveness. But it's not just throwing money at it. At Unilever, we certainly uh, didn't see anybody leave during my 10-year tenure. Few exceptions, but not anybody leave. But yet everybody could have worked for another company and earn more. But they were part of a mission. Collectively, they were able to do things that, that they wouldn't be able to do by themselves. That was important enough to them. You know, reaching 1.3 billion people, improving their health and well-being, even with simple things like bar soaps, where we did hand washing campaigns that literally saved millions of lives a year. That's what motivated people. Trying to get peop uh, address the uh, poverty that is under the uh, farmer community. 
usually the farmers are the ones that actually go to bed hungry, believe well, it or not. Well, how do you communicate that? So did you spend a lot in internal communications? Because a lot of the times you could have a chief executive that has great ideas, you know, a, a lot of kind of fire in the belly to change things. Right. But the person way at the bottom of the chain may not know that. So you have to make sure that a, a good message goes across the board. Oh, absolutely. So obviously you have your vision that you communicate, uh, but that many companies do. The challenge is how do you make it come alive? So you have to work on many things. You have to work on your leadership teams. You have to work on your own behaviors. You have to work on the incentive systems or measurements that you put around that. You have to put capabilities in place. It's very hard work. It's very hard work. But the, the, the in Unilever, the penny dropped, I would say, when we could show that these brands that had this higher purpose, Dove standing for women's self-esteem, or uh, um, Domestos building more toilets to attack the issues of open defecation, or Life by a Bar Soap helping a child reach the age of five. When those brands were starting to grow faster and be more profitable, the penny dropped. The um, other uh, thing that people want is they don't want to be part of creating problems. Nobody wants to be part of a problem. They don't want to be accused at dinner conversations that they put the plastics in the oceans or that they cut the forests in the, uh, of, of this world or that they, uh, they uh, kill the biodiversity that we all need to live. They don't want to be accused of being part of the 8 million people that die of air pollution because their factories are still running on coal. So they want to work for companies that might not be perfect, but are certainly becoming part of the solutions. And as these solutions become bigger, or the sense of urgency becomes higher, you need to do that partly individually, but increasingly collectively. What approach did you take to the pay at the top, though, as well? Because in terms of motivating people, you know, they, obviously over the last decades, the, the gap between the C-suite compensation and the people in the factories has obviously widened enormously. Was that something you tried to limit? And what do you, where do you stand on this argument that maybe in, here in Britain we need to pay chief executives more? We, we're still paying them less here than they do in the United yeah. States. So I don't want to talk too much about myself, but I never talked when I went into Unilever. My only request was to be sure that we had a gender diverse board. We had a very diverse board of six white Brits and six white Dutch, and boy, could they disagree. But I said, we need a global board. We need uh, gender diversity. We were the first board in the UK with 50% women. We had two from Africa, two from the Far East, the first black woman from uh, that went to Harvard and such, and a very good board, actually. And uh, that was, to me, important because I needed the support uh, driving these major transformations. And, and boards that are aligned with what you do is, uh, is so important to, to be successful. Um, but other than that, I did not ask anything. So I, I, my starting salary was less than my predecessor. And then um, you do benchmarks like anybody does. It's a race to the top because CEOs are very carefully trying to find the right pool of benchmarking so that it looks like they get underpaid. And mm -hmm. there is this notion that has crept in. If I don't get more than the other, the perception must be that I do a worse job. So from the start, I said I don't want my salary to be moved. I earned more than I thought I ever would uh, earn. And uh, it was more than I ever needed. So I changed the compensation plan for Unilever quite dramatically, uh, made it a, uh, a uh, performance-driven plan, made it a five-year plan, so it's long-term focus, uh, suggested that people invest their short-term bonuses in the company shares to be committed instead of anything else, and, and could only participate in the long-term plans if they did that. So the performance requirements went actually up. People had to work twice as hard to get paid less, and it didn't make anybody leave because they were all paid well. And when the company started doing well behind our strategy, when we got our 300% return, people were rewarded. And every year when the board came and said, we want to pay you more because you're grossly underpaid, I said, I don't want it, but I want you to put it in the annual report so that people see that we should have pay restraint. It is unacceptable that in the US, for example, if you look since the end of the 70s till now, CEO pay has gone up uh, nearly 1,500%. Uh, no, no, 1,500%. That is far ahead of what even the stock market went up. So that is no link to performance. That is just uh, uh, driven by greed. There's nothing Where else. Where does that end? Does that just keep Where going? Where does that, that end? The average pay now, uh, total compensation in the FUCHI 100 here for the biggest companies is $13 million. That's more than I earned every year in Unilever, but it doesn't bother me. 
But wh why should we have these high salaries to attract talent? Is the issue of attraction the salary? Or is the issue of attraction the purpose or the UK economy or the low pound because of uh, Brexit or other things? So what are the real issues that prevent you? Often it is because many companies don't have good succession planning in place. So why throw money at a problem when that problem is not created by the money? And frankly, when society needs more trust, the worst thing that you can do is uh, keep cranking up CEO salaries. Last year, the salaries in the UK went up 20% for CEOs, when the average worker in the street had to suffer still the tremendous consequences from, from uh, COVID. It just doesn't make sense. That's what I'm trying to say to CEOs. If you want to gain the trust, because at the end of the day, it's all about trust. If you want to lead these companies, and how do you get people with you when you lead these companies, is to be trustworthy. You know, and a trustworthy comes from behavior. So it's great to have great statements, great values, or, or overall missions. But if your behavior doesn't align, you get a rotten culture. And that is what happens in most of these companies that run into trouble. We see it over and over and over again. So salaries is a very important um, signal or lightning rod for how you really behave as CEOs. Uh, Paul, th there's some M&A transactions or takeover deals that are very hostile and frankly are the stuff of bludgeons. You had to fend off and, yes. and 115 billion pounds were offered, right? Yes. By Kraft Heinz. Like, who's the first person you called? Do, do you remember that day when you got the call? Oh, so absolutely. They offered me 100 million, I'll tell you transparently here on, on the program. They, they offered me 100 million because they think everything is for sale. No, morals are not for sale. Right, so somebody called well, you. So what happened? Somebody, you get on the, you get a phone call from someone. Well, yeah, I got a phone call from someone. At that time, we were um, uh, divesting the uh, margarine business because the market was declining. Russia was being closed, so butter became cheaper. It was a business that wasn't global for us, so we decided to go out. And uh, I got a visit from uh, someone from their side that uh, I thought was looking at the margarine business. And he's, uh, he comes in and he says, we want to make an offer for the total company. So so you were shocked? Well, uh, you know, uh, th this is a moment that at least five seconds you w is better not to say anything. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, I've, I've, so I, always, uh, I always feel that um, uh, whatever happens to you, you just need to think about what you're going to do and not get into the panic mode. So, so there is a after? silence. So the beauty is oh. there's a silence because if the offer is not public, um, then um, nothing happens. And as soon as the rumors are there, the one who makes the offer has to then declare it publicly. And that came out in Alpha about a week later. So I was about to go to uh, Myanmar and, uh, and uh, Southeast Asia for business visits, which I continued. But it gave me a week to think about this. Uh, obviously, I had informed the board. Obviously, we had formed a group of people. Immediately, and, uh, did you get uh, did uh, you get on the phone with every single board member? Oh, immediately, yeah, 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 yeah. No, you have to. When you get an offer like that, that's your fiduciary duty. I would be wrong not to do that. Um, but I also had prepared many scenarios. You say, when are you a good CEO or not? Uh, obviously, you learn the sailing in the storms. You don't learn the sailing in the harbor. But you can practice a lot in the harbor. And we had practiced a lot with board scenarios. You always need to do that. So uh, what if an activist would come on the board? What if we would have an offer? Now, we thought it would never happen, given the size of the company and the success. This was, by the way, not driven by underperformance in our share price. We were outperforming our competitors. We were outperforming the market. We actually were outperforming Warren Buffett, who was part of that consortium. So it wasn't a performance issue. It was purely a financial manipulation issue to get more out of it for a few people. The battle between a few billionaires and a company that was fighting for the billions of people. Were, were the board unanimous in wanting to reject it like you, or was well, anyone Well, absolutely, tempted? but unanimous is also what are you going to do about it? What are the learnings? How, what are you, because your share price goes up 17%, that was the offer they made. Your share price goes up 17%. It's interesting, many of the shareholders that claim to be long-term see an opportunity. You find out that many of them get paid on the quarter, and if they miss the opportunity, their bonus is down. So there's a reality out there, but we immediately, um, took actions that uh, I think the market liked. Um, because if you look at uh, the, the few years afterwards, our share price went up a, f a further 60, 70 percent. Theirs collapsed to, to well below when they started the company. But Paul, and, you, and you said no to 100 million without batting an eyelid. You didn't think no, about no, it? No, no, I actually took it. Uh, I have to honestly tell you, and you're now shocked. 
I am because, shocked. Uh, and that's why I'm saying it this way. Because I said, I said to this person, I'm happy to take it. And, and thank you very much. But I want you to know that I'm going to spend it all against you because I'm totally against this form of, uh, of business. So I said, that's why I would take it, to totally spend it against you. And I would have a very, uh, I have a, would have a lot of pleasure doing that. So he didn't even understand the joke of this, but obviously it never happened. We, we, um, this is the first time that they went away and we did that over the weekend. Um, but you know, we had to look at things. Our balance sheet was not well leveraged with uh, serfs as well when you have COVID and all, we were conservative. And uh, so we leveraged our balance sheet up a little bit more. Uh, some shareholders felt that they could get a little bit more return from us at that time. So we gave a, a modest share buyback. These were things I personally would not have done, but, but to put a floor under the share price, you have to compromise. I always call it um, being um, a principally right, but practically wrong is not a good position to be in. So do you think, was that whole episode, when you look back on it, the defining moment for your tenure as CEO at Unilever? I certainly was glad that it happened in year eight because I was a little stronger in my shoes and there was a little bit more confidence with the board. There was a confidence with all of our stakeholders. And what we found when this happened was actually I got a lot of support from all of the stakeholders and, and from all channels, including people like Al Gore or even Bono who was willing to. But these were people that we had, we had um, you know, in our network and, and had taken care of. And, and so I, I think when you stand with the world, the world stands with you. I firmly believe that. And I also think we would have won that had it come to a vote. Even though I went to Theresa May at that time and told her very clearly that the takeover court in the US is, uh, in the UK is absolutely stacked against the person that is being attacked. It's really wrongly written and that has cost a lot of business in the UK. It has actually weakened the UK uh, from a corporate point of view. So we've seen some minor changes there because then you need to go into what do you do about it. So I worked with Brussels, I worked with the UK and other countries to look at these takeover codes. But I also think it, it brought the debate of what type of capitalism do we want, brought it further to the foreground. More books were written about it. I think companies became a little bit more aware. Many CEOs said, yeah, I wish I could do that. I'm, I'm telling them you can, if you have the courage to do so. But I think it brought, brought forward what type of uh, society do we want to live in? You know, what do we want to celebrate? 